right, welcome to the AI and Big Data in Finance uh, webinar. We are delighted to have our two distinguished uh, speakers today. Uh, so we are going to have uh, Daniel Rock from Wharton, who is going to present his papers, GPTs uh, or GPTs, um, and Daron Asimoglu from MIT is going to be uh, the discussant. Uh, Daniel is going to have 30 minutes uh, for his presentation. After about 15 minutes, uh, I may briefly interrupt um, Danielle to, to give the audience the opportunity to ask clarifying questions. Um, and Daron is going to have then 20 minutes for his discussions. And afterwards, I'm going to, we're going to open the floor for questions from the audience. Um, as audience, uh, we're going to ask you to please submit your questions in the Q&A, um, and then I'm going to call on you during the, the questioning part. Um, and so as a reminder, please be respectful with your comments. The presentation is and, and the discussion are going to be recorded, and together with the slides, they're going to be posted on our website. Um, then after the main part of the webinar, we're going to have an unrecorded discussion where everyone is going to, uh, in the audience, um, the participants that remain online will be upgraded uh, to be a panelist, and then everyone will have a chance to interact and exchange with Danielle and Daron. Uh, so, Danielle, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you to the organizers, uh, uh, Leah, Marcus, uh, and the others for um, having me here and thank you uh to Jerome for agreeing to discuss so let me share my screen here and uh we'll get going okay can everyone see that all right all right thumbs up that's good news all right so this project uh you know we did a lot of work to to get the pun to work in the title it's uh gpts or gpts an early look at the labor market impact potential of large language models and to those of you who know the inside baseball here um when we say GPTs, we could mean uh, generative pre-trained transformers, which is what we mean on the, the first GPT. And on the second GPT, we mean general purpose technologies, um, which you know, for economists means quite a lot. And um, you know, kind of ironically, uh, through the test that I'll show you today, I think what we learn about large language models is that we don't actually know very much about where they're going to diffuse and how they're gonna change the economy. Um, using the fact that we know that they are going to be general purpose technologies. And I'll get into that um, a little more in a few moments. But um, I do want to acknowledge my wonderful co-authors uh, at OpenAI, Tyna Alondo, Sam Manning, and Pamela Mishkin. Um, they, they did a ton of great work on this and taught me so much um, as, I, as I went through the work uh, myself. So, OK, what are we going to talk, today, talk about today? First, we're going to discuss you know, how do we get here? What are these models doing that's sort of new? Um, then I'll talk about our approach to understanding whether or not uh, GPTs, generative pre-trained transformers, are general purpose technologies. I'm going to try to use GPT, the acronym, to describe the transformer just because it's more of a mouthful. All right, so our headline conclusions, uh, sort of following work by uh, Avi Goldfarb, uh, Laurenta Tateritis, and Lady Tasca, we find that, you know, just like machine learning in general, there's good evidence from the labor market that these are going to, that LLMs and, and generative AI more broadly um, are going to be general purpose technologies. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means three things. One, you know, they're pervasive. They're going to affect lots of different areas of the economy. Two, they improve over time. I'm actually going to kind of punt on that one because it's sort of obvious that these technologies are improving over time. And three, kind of the key one, general purpose technologies require a complementary investment um, to unlock their full gains. And once we know that that's the case, then asking, you know, how are large language models going to change the labor market uh, in equilibrium, for example, is a little like trying to ask James Watt, while they're still pumping water out of uh, coal mines, you know, what is the steam engine going to do to the world economy? So in a sense, by doing this test, we can say, hey, we need to be a little bit um, more restricted in terms of how the conclusions we make. You know, when people say, 40% of all jobs are going to get automated, I immediately start to doubt uh, that kind of fact. On the other hand, you know, we can say something about where things are going to change and who might be exposed. When we talk about exposure, I don't mean, you know, good or bad exposure can be either, but we find that about 80% of workers have roughly 10% of their tasks exposed. So this is a big deal, but I don't think there's evidence that, you know, the the job apocalypse is coming to, you know, borrow the job, job apocalypse. I don't remember exactly how, to say, um, how that's coming to borrow a term. So, you know, we got 
two things for this. One is measurements of where we think exposure is going to be highest. And then we also get a sense that um, we can test these three different hypotheses. So many jobs are likely to change. Many processes are likely to change. But the equilibrium is very hard to forecast. Um, and our method you know, might give us some indication in the near term of where things might change um, at the task level. So you know, these arguments about IT-based job displacement to kind of fit uh, large language models into a you know, a broader category. They're not new. Uh, Daron has done great work on this, obviously, David Otter and others. You know, the, the big trend over the last few decades has been that non-routine work has become prioritized in the economy. Routine work has kind of stagnated or declined a little bit. Uh, routine cognitive work in particular is uh, especially exposed to this, um, this wave of IT that started, you know, probably in the, you know, arguably late 70s uh, and 80s, but, you know, really started to show up in the 90s. So, um, you know, we have an argument that sometimes uh, these new technologies are different. Uh, sometimes they're the same. I think with large language models and generative AI, probably machine learning in general, there's a little bit of column A, a little bit of column B. It's, it's not a guarantee on, on either side. So um, my, my colleague, co-author, former advisor, Eric Nielsen, likes to say that uh, AI is the most G of all GPTs. Now I'm using general purpose technology as the acronym. Um, so, you know, there are a bunch of people who try to make the argument that this time is different. Maybe this time it is different. Um, I think if you're going to make that argument, this is the strongest place to do it. Uh, but, you know, that's also been true in the past. Um, if you ask a uh, computer scientist, I should have a, a site for this, but I don't. But, um, you know, lots of people think full automation of, of labor is coming. Uh, wide confidence bands 100 to 125 years from now. Um, I think these, um, if you ask computer scientists about whether or not we'd solve Go, um, they said that was years away. This is from 2016. That obviously happened a lot faster. I think generally when it's, it comes time to estimating the capabilities of these models and where it'll be in a few years, it's helpful to have wide confidence bands. Um, if you had asked me in 2019 if I thought an AI system could write a convincing essay given a prompt, I probably would have said no, um, though I will say that the community and the measures that people were building did pick up a lot of the variation that was going to come from generative AI. So um, in a sense, it's better to trust the data we create and not the opinions we have. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I'm OK with that. Another thing I wouldn't have predicted, you know, chaos GPT. I don't know if you've seen if you all have seen uh, auto GPT, but it's you give it a prompt and it kind of recursively queries um, trying to, to accomplish some end goal. And, you know, Chaos GPT, uh, someone gave it the prompt, destroy all of humanity, and it's trying to do that by tweeting. Um, so, yeah, it's good to kind of release these tools out there and see what they're going to try to do. I don't think it's going to end the world by tweeting, but maybe, um, you know, there's there's usefulness in seeing what people are going to try to do with these tools. And then when these models become more powerful, we at least have a sense of the sorts of things they might be asked to do. So hopefully this thing doesn't kill us all. But um, in the meantime, we can start to think about you know, what jobs might be affected, where things might change. You know, I was, uh, I was speaking at a conference last week, but others were talking about how we include AI within the broader tent of um, humanity. And I, I kind of felt, you know, odd getting up there the next day and saying, well, I'm going to ask what, what's going to happen to accountants. So it's a little bit of a different story. All right. So GPTs or GPTs, what are we going to do? Well, first, we develop a new rubric uh, to measure the exposure of tasks uh, to different LLM capabilities. And we keep this simple on purpose because we are going to ask both humans and GPT-4 to score all the tasks in the economy according to our rubric. Um, so that rubric is the re reason it's or the, the structure of the rubric is, uh, you know, there's only three categories for tasks. One is that you can double your productivity with no drop in quality and using LLMs to do those tasks. So that's category one. Two is you can't. And that's category two. And then category three is, OK, you can use LLMs to double your productivity in doing this task, but you're going to need additional systems or software, um, maybe image techniques or you know, some other thing that you have to build around the LLM in order to unlock that value. So by testing the difference between category one and category three there, um, we get a sense of how much complementary innovation is going to be needed throughout the economy. Comparing the differences in exposure, we can start to get at that. Uh, general purpose technology um, criteria three or criterion three. All right, so we have uh, human contractors here. They work with OpenAI. They understand the capabilities of these models pretty well. Um, they're going to be scoring um, all of the tasks. The tasks come from ONET, for those who are familiar. Um, and then we also have GPT-4. We're going to compare and see, okay, well, 
how well do humans and GPT-4 agree? Um, and, uh, you know, then we'll, we'll start to see, you know, maybe maybe we can use GPT-4 and, and related technologies in social science research a little bit more. Now, we're testing this hypothesis, are GPTs GPTs? We are not asking the question, you know, are all the algos going to take our jobs? And um, the, the media, in, in some contexts, have picked up this paper and others and said, oh, they said 80% of jobs are going to be automated. And, um, you know, I like to say if I still had hair, I'd probably be pulling it out. Um, you know, at that conclusion, it's that's not at all what we're saying because you know exposure, as we as we know, um, it's a limited measure, but uh, it does uh, cut both ways. You could be augmenting workers, you could be automating workers at the micro level. Automating some tasks can be great because it lets you focus on things that really matter. Um, you know, while augmenting can be kind of terrible if like one person does the job of thirty. Uh, at the macro level, obviously, we don't want to automate away all of human labor without having some sort of system. Um, you know, to help people share in the gains, you know, arguably, you know, or arguably you don't want to do it at all, then augmentation is better. But we're not getting into that uh, with, with this paper on its own. Okay, so some quick things just to give you a sense of how quickly this stuff is improving. It's qualitative. I'm, I'm not, I will show you a little bit of evidence if there's time about how quickly things are developing. But in like 2014, you know, people are using, say, variational autoencoders to generate images like this grainy black and white image of a face. And that's, I thought at the time, wow, that's crazy and remarkable. But now, you know, we almost take for granted that um, that AI systems can develop very high quality images of faces and other kinds of things. Mid Journey is a ton of fun to play around with if you if you haven't. But this is, you know, for a decade of progress, this is extraordinary. Um, and we can think about why that is. So, um, as my co-authors taught me, and you know, this this uh, image, I'm I'm told by some experts, is perhaps not to scale. But there are many, many more parameters in, say, GPT-4 versus GPT-3. So two big things that have changed with these models. One is the scale. This is, you know, effectively how many parameters the models have. And some of them are actually kind of inefficient. So scale is going to be less important going forward because we're going to be building more efficient models uh, that accomplish the same kind of goals. But this has been a big source of gains uh, in the recent past. And it might be some source of gains going forward. But what's really a breakthrough recently is giving these models taste. So we can build uh, a large language model that generates thousands of texts given, given a prompt. Those texts are all slightly different, it's stochastic. But um, what's difficult there is knowing which ones of those are good responses to the prompt and which ones are bad. And historically, that's kind of been our domain. Like people pick out what the right um, prompt is gonna be. So with reinforcement learning, you may have heard of reinforcement learning with human feedback. Uh, people say, okay, these ones are the good ones. Let's rank order which ones are good and which ones are bad. And then the model tries to generate output that will make you happy. So this is part of why we get hallucinations, right? You know, it's not, the model's not trying to lie to you. It's not trying to be confidently lying. It's trying to make you pleased with the thing that it, it puts out. Um, so that sense of this is a good response to a prompt versus a, this is a bad one, that's taste. And that's a new characteristic of these models um, that that hasn't existed before. Within the reinforcement learning uh, with human feedback, you know, RLHF, the important letter there is the F, the feedback process. We can use AI feedback and, and so on. Um, just making sure that these models can learn that reward function. All right, so we talked about the three criteria for general purpose technology. So I'm gonna get into what we did here. All right, so for those of you who aren't familiar with the ONET database, there's a, a sort of taxonomy of tasks. Um, at each occupation level, there's about a thousand of those. There are detailed work activities that are shared across all of those different occupations, so about 2,100 of those. And then within detailed work activities, if you want to make an occupation-specific-ish uh, detailed work activity, you get a task. So like a gambling cage worker, the detailed work activity, and there's about 30 of these per worker, um, you know, might be execute sales or other financial transactions, online merchants of the same detailed work activity, but then the gambling cage worker version of it is cash checks and process credit card advances for patrons. The latter part of that statement's a little worrying, but um, you know the, these tasks and, uh, and and DWAs are shared across all the workers. The tasks tend to be less shared while the DWAs are designed to be uh, common. So what we're going to do is run through each one of these tasks for GPT-4, the DWAs for um, the human raters, and we're going to score them either E0, you can't use LLMs at all to improve your productivity in this task, E1, uh, we would double our productivity using LLMs. Um, 
sorry, I'll just bring it up here. We would double our productivity using LLMs alone, or in other words, we'd cut the time it takes to do this task by, um, by half. Or LLM plus exposed E2, and my apologies for reversing the categories earlier. E2 is like, uh, we can use LLMs to double our productivity, but we need additional software. And now the prompts themselves, when you give them to GPT-4, it kind of depends the ordering you you present the prompts are a little bit brittle. Um, it helps to put E0 up front because then it defaults to, and tell it explicitly to default to E0 if you're not sure. Um, so many of the tasks that end up as E0 are the kind of physical tasks uh, that you think would be the domain of robots. Um, so one of the weaknesses of the study, I think, is that we're explicitly not thinking about how LLMs and related technologies can be used for robots and physical work. So that's gonna automatically exclude an enormous category of work um, because we wanna be focused on what's you know near term kind of imaginable and easy for, for human and uh, GPT-4 to uh, evaluate. All right, so when we look at the, G the human and the GPT-4 ratings, you see some sort of interesting patterns. Um, so these are human ratings on the X axis, GPT-4 on the Y, the left side, it's just the bin scatter of the right side. Um, generally, they tend to agree. Okay, so this is at the occupation level. Um, you do get some diversification benefit as you do with any one of these uh, kinds of measures where like uh, the more tasks you have, the more it kind of gets shrunk towards the mean. But generally humans, you know, humans tend to be, have a little bit more vision about where LLMs might go. Maybe GPT-4 doesn't want to do those tasks, so it's not telling us it can. Um, but, you know, these are, it's a hypothetical LLM that has more capabilities, um, you know, to think about the exposure in general. But generally, you know, GPT-4 and humans, they kind of agree with each other, um, at least qualitatively enough that we can start to, to make similar claims from the data they both generate. So here's kind of a, a Sankey plot of the, some similar information. We run a few different prompts for GPT-4 to kind of test how brittle they are. And the important thing here off the Sankey diagram, we've got our humans on the left, and then GPT-4 rubric one, which is going to be most of our results in the middle, GPT-4 rubric two on the right, you know, as a robustness check, if you kind of squint at this thing, you see three stripes. You know, there's the blue stripe. The blue stripe is the mostly physical work. It's about 40 to 50% of the economy. Um, this is stuff that's just not exposed to large language models. So right off the bat, we know those statements, like, you know, 40% of jobs are going to get fully automated. Not true. Like that, that, at least there's, there's not good evidence from what we have for that to be true. Then there's the middle stripe, that E2, where we'd expect a lot of disagreement. This is where, okay, maybe additional systems are helpful. Maybe they're not. Um, and then on the bottom, we've got E1, they're definitely exposed. So most of the disagreement um, around E1 pulls into E2, which is what you'd want to see. You know, think about that, like Markov transition matrix, like where are we seeing probabilities? Um, we don't see as much except for a very thin ribbon, which may be noise, um, of like the red stuff from humans ending up in the blue stuff from machines or, or vice versa. So, you know, we're getting a reasonable sense of what the capabilities of the models are and where we might see exposure, at least enough to test the hypothesis. Will this pre be pervasive and will it require complementary innovation? All right, so what did we find here? Well, um, about, uh, you know, these, these scores vary from zero to one. So we're gonna assign zero for E0, we're gonna assign 100% for E1 in terms of exposure. And then um, we're gonna kind of vary how we think about E2 as an outcome measure. Um, most of the results we're going to use like 0.5. So we're going to say, okay, you need other systems. We're going to say 50% uh, instead of 100% or 0%. So we find that, you know, on just the basis of E1 at the occupation level, maybe 14% of tasks. Um, you know, whether you ask humans or GPT-4, that's the mean. 14% of tasks are exposed. Um, on the other hand, if you're really permissive about where you think exposure might show up, uh, humans say it's about 46% of uh, occupations, um, you know, are, are fully exposed and GPT-4, it's about 55%. So that's, that's the range. It's between 14 and 55%, depending on, you know, which one you, you favor. I tend to favor the, the middle one, 34%, um, because I think, you know, I'm sort of a stodgy economist on this, I think it's going to take decades for this to play out. So it's reasonable to think that these complementary innovations are important, it's just not like an instantaneous thing. So the types of jobs that get exposed under that regime, mathematicians, blockchains, and blockchain engineers, it's kind of funny, that's a job. Proofreaders and clerks, and you know, so there's kind of two categories of work that show up in exposure. One is high-end knowledge work, and another kind of is like clerical work. Um, and I'll show you, you know, some differences in those exposures in a minute. You know, some folks are saying mathematicians aren't exposed, this thing can't do arithmetic. And then like a couple of days later, the Wolfram Alpha 
uh, plugin showed up and, you know, we were like, yeah, okay, so you can do math with these things right now. And it's not, it's not a, when I say exposed again, it's not like this is just about automation. It's about automation and augmentation and everything in between. So, you know, mathematicians who are using large language models to do their work are not just relying on the uh, output of the large language model to be done. They're, they're using it to help them uh, do better work and, and injecting their thought into it as well. So, you know, I, I've used it to convert code from different um, languages one to the other. Uh, GPT-3 was not very good at Stata. GPT-4 kind of is much better at Stata. So that that's helpful. I primarily code in Python where it's great. So what are the exposed roles that we see, you know, under our kind of middle measure? It's, it's that mixture. We've got data entry keyers in here. We've got telephone operators. We've also got web developers, data warehousing specialists, computer programmers. Um, it's kind of a hodgepodge of people who do really intensive knowledge work and, you know, people who are doing routine cognitive tasks, um, you know, from the past. So, you know, that, that might be cause for worry for a lot of people. And I think that's maybe where some of the anxiety is coming from in the, in the press and other places. The, you know, on the x-axis and the, the top set of plots here, we've got log of total employment, and then we've got the human ratings on the left, GPT-4 ratings on the right. They mostly agree. And there's a little bit of a, you know, positive uh, correlation here with how many people are employed in a job and how exposed people are, but it's not like, I, I wouldn't hang my hat on it. It's not like statistically significant, the differences across the, the groups. Where we do see kind of a more marked trend is on the, the lower set of plots, as you go to higher wages, um, you know, we got log annual wage there, uh, the ratings from both humans and GPT-4 go up. So unlike, I think the last iteration of machine learning technologies where, um, like uh, my co-authors and I, Eric uh, Brunelson, Morgan Frank, uh, Tom Mitchell, and Yad Rawan, we found like a negative correlation between wages and supervised learning exposure primarily. Here, it's a positive correlation. So um, there's a lot of work like lawyers, uh, pharmacists, jobs that, you know, if you think about the job zones that some folks have used in their work, where we think about, how, you know, what are the barriers to entry for this kind of work? Um, job zones four and five, the highest barrier to entry kinds of jobs, those are in orange and yellow over there. Um, as you, you know, vary the threshold for, you know, what co constitutes exposure, um, you see that those jobs are the most exposed, like the, the lawyers, the pharmacists, uh, accountants, people who do knowledge work, um, they are firmly in the crosshairs for change here in a way that, you know, uh, electricians or um, you know, various types of like construction workers, they're just not. And the, the barriers to entry for those kinds of work uh, tend to be lower. So this is a, a new kind of uh, power dynamic that, that potentially generates a, a bunch of anxiety. Um, but yeah, uh, so this, sorry, apologies. Uh, this graph is showing up as kind of small, but I, I can describe it. So this is grouping exposure by industry. So the variation by industry is pretty large, though every industry is a reasonably you know, high set of exposure in certain domains. So at the very top, we've got more than 60% exposure. That's stuff like data processing, uh, other information services. This is the place where like Google lives or, um, you know, maybe dating apps or something like that. Credit, interme credit intermediation, so banks, uh, trading houses, and so on. Um, at the lower end, where it's not as much about knowledge work um, or, you know, knowledge is incorporated in, in different ways, social assistance or uh, forestry, these kinds of industries, um, they're, they're less exposed, but there's still something for large language models to do. Um, so this establishes, you know, between these few graphs, it's pervasive, but it's, it's sort of diffuse. It's, it's pervasive and diffuse, but it's, uh, it's sort of uh, uh, varied. It's heterogeneous where we get the exposure. So that leads me to a question, you know, are we going to get bommeled on this one? Um, which is to say, you know, I'm a little worried that the uh, least productive sectors of the economy are going to grow to be an even greater share of our total inputs. Um, so what we did was we looked at the growth in total factor productivity. We also did this for labor productivity, got similar results. And we looked at, you know, say we've got log industry employment on the x-axis, TFP on the y-axis. And what we're looking for is to see, is there a correlation between the industry level exposure to these tools and uh, recent productivity growth. And there's not really much of one, which I think is an optimistic story because if there's a way to get higher productivity into healthcare, housing, education, 
the things that we really care about um, that have become super expensive relative to say TVs and clothing, um, you know, that's a very exciting story. So I don't see evidence so far that we're we're gonna have to deal with Baumol's cost disease. All right, so I only have uh, about what, five minutes here, Leah, is that right? Um, or we start, you have about seven, seven minutes. That's seven cool. minutes, okay, cool, perfect. So we can test as well by looking at these different measures. So how, how permissive are we from E0 uh, and E1 being the only real thing we're looking at? So, um, you know, if you have to use complementary systems, we count it as a zero. To uh, if you have to use complementary systems, we count it as a one. Um, by comparing those things, we can see how much is complementary innovation uh, going to matter. And that's you know the fact that this these sets of polygons generate a pretty wide grid implies that we have to build a lot to make large language models more pervasive and expose more jobs um, or more types of work. Um, and that means you know in, to my mind changing business processes, changing um, organizational structures, uh, reconfiguring entire systems to deploy the technology effectively. This is the old story of the Paul David uh, Dynamo story. Um, we're going to probably see that again with, with generative AI. And to make that concrete when it comes to the technology, like immediately, you know, we can see generating code, generating text and images. That's something you can kind of plug and play in a lot of places. So that's going to probably diffuse pretty quickly. In fact, it has in many cases already. But there's a whole other set of technologies that don't rely on the decoder where we generate text, but rather you know, rely on the encoder where we take this mass of unstructured data that we've been collecting for a long time and represent it numerically and can use that to help computers talk to each other in new probabilistic ways. That's a different type of software that hasn't existed before. And we're just starting to see the benefits of that. So, you know, vector databases, uh, building chatbots on top of unstructured data. So, you know, like for my students this uh, this coming year, I'm going to build a, a Q&A bot where they can talk with the syllabus, where they can ask Hayek questions about his 1945 paper that you know, Jerome was uh, discussing on Twitter a little while ago. Um, or they can have conversations with each other because they can take their memos and upload them. And that's a great way to get compliance in terms of like not using GPT to just regurgitate a, a prompt answer. So I think that sort of thing, I, you know, that's my one little example from, from teaching, but I, I think there's many others, uh, millions of those kinds of applications throughout the economy. So in the last few minutes, you know, let's talk about, we had the most exposed role. There's a question too of, you know, automation versus what we're seeing in exposure overall. So we built an automation rubric. Um, we only rated that with GPT-4. We didn't get the chance to validate it with humans, but what you see, when you compare automation exposure to um, overall exposure, the automation exposure shows up in the routine cognitive work. It's the telephone operators, the clerks, the credit authorizers, um, the statistical assistants, and so on. So if we're worried about automation, um, you know, capturing a few of these jobs and creating, you know, say inequality, these are the places where I would be concerned. And you know, for once, I, I think when it comes to policy, I'm suggesting things like don't. Don't think too much about the cause and think about the symptoms. If someone's displaced, do we really care why they're displaced or do we just want to help them out? Um, so these are the kinds of places where I would be worried. All right. And when you look at the correlation between exposure um, and, uh, and overall exposure and automation exposure, um, like the, the coefficient on that regression is like 0.94 and the R squared is about 46% to give you a sense of like how much these are similar measures to each other. Okay, so I punted on timing last couple of minutes. I'm going to talk about that too. Um, you know, some of you may have seen this graph. This is the difference between GPT 3.5, kind of stock chat GPT versus GPT 4 um, performance on a whole bunch of different exams. You're going from like 10% performance on the bar exam to somewhere between 70 and 90% performance on the bar exam. It's a major shift. All right, and then what we thought we'd do is we look at we look at GitHub and look at forks over time. People fork a GitHub repo when they want to build on it and change it. Um, the last two GPT releases didn't do a ton, but you can see kind of in the visual of these squares here, ChatGPT created you know, a massive focusing of developer effort. So that, to give you a sense of how big this is, when COVID happened and people went home and started working on data science repos because they were bored, this is like twice that size in absolute terms, which is you know absolutely enormous. So you might say, okay, well, that what happened to other things that are similar? Here's a we we queried these repos to see are they LLM related or data science related. You do see a little bit of an uptick in data science around that time, but it doesn't 
come anywhere close to matching the, the GPT related one. So the developers are starting to build tools. And of course, you know, the, having you know a sense that we want a real control group here, we're going to run three different types of difference and difference um, approaches. So the ordinary ones, synthetic difference and difference, and then we'll run synthetic controls. It doesn't really matter which one you do, which is a little bit of a bummer if you're excited about these new diff and diff techniques, because basically it tells you you don't need econometrics. You can just look at the graph and uh, you're good to go. So you know that feeling, that feeling can be a, a bit bittersweet, but it's up and to the right. The tool builders are building tools. It's going to make it easier. It's going to democratize training these models. There's maybe three to 400 people in the world who can train a state-of-the-art model right now. The toolkits that people are making at the moment make it, you know, like you know, so people like me can maybe one day uh, train these things as well. So cat's out of the bag a little bit. Um, people talk about restricting access to software. That's sort of intuitively difficult for a zero marginal cost production good. Um, but, you know, the evidence that people are building to make that more difficult um, is pretty strong. All right. So last thing, you know, how do we know this work? I want to give some credit to the community of the last decade measuring these things in different ways. Um, though with univariate uh, measures of exposure in other ways like routine manual or Michael Webb's robot um, measures, like you do get a negative correlation with our scores. Um, you know, the suitability for machine learning and uh, the Felton, Raj, and Siemens measure for AI, those tend to be positively correlated. Um, in bivariate uh, regressions, um, those did pretty well. But if you throw the kitchen sink at it, you take all of them, um, that combination of measures explains somewhere between 60 and 70% of the variation in our scores. So there's something new here, but there's also something old. And um, you know that provides some validity to, to what the community has been doing, trying to measure exposure of tasks and jobs to these new technologies. So lastly, um, last two minutes here, we also figured we'd survey the 3 million people or so on, um, on the OpenAI Discord. Like, what do you use ChatGPT for at work? Here's some of the things that they do. So it's a lot of software engineers, some educators, some data scientists. Um, and about 1,000 people told us what they do. So what we figured we'd do is we'd rate their tasks using the, the rubric and see what we got. And then we'd also figure, like, OK, let's let's map them to the closest ONET task and see what kind of labels we got. And, you know, the worry we'd have is that a bunch of things people said they're actually doing, we rated as not exposed. Um, and we didn't find, we found that happened 3% of the time. Okay, so if you put this into a TSNI, this gray area is the stuff that's not exposed at all. Um, and then blue is exposed with compliments and orange is exposed on its own. Those black circles are where people said, yeah, I'm using GPT to do something. And we're actually refining this because the language people used on uh, the Discord server is different than the language the government uses, so you have to do a little bit of a translation exercise. But the, the key thing here is that that big gray area is not filled with black circles. Um, so that's kind of nice. We, you know, it's, of course, the survey's got some selection bias, but we can test that, like, okay, the stuff at least that we said wasn't exposed isn't exposed uh, from what people are using uh, it for. All right, so I'll skip through this stuff because uh, I'm out of time here, but, um, you know, some some other food for thought, like at the macro level, the big question then is how long is this going to take? And I don't think we have a, a great sense of what that would be. My co-authors not even disagree on some of that. Um, and then, you know, is this going to be TFP? Is it going to be labor augmenting change? Um, are we going to see the creation of a whole bunch of new tasks? Or are we going to see more automation? And then something that I think often gets lost is like how much capital augmentation are we going to see? Which is, you know, probably if you believe capital and labor are, are complements, that's great news. If we see a ton of capital replacement and maybe creation of new tasks for capital, um, that might drive up the demand for labor of different kinds in the, in the long run. So at the micro level, I mean, another big question. Um, so to shout out to a friend of mine, Joel, for bringing up that equilibrium effects are kind of the, the main thing that I think economists bring to this table um, that some of the AI folks maybe miss. And then you know, thinking about where where's productivity changing, there's some great micro studies there and, and kind of the IO of the, the uh, GPT production chain. Um, I think that's really interesting too. So I'll leave it there. Thank you so much uh, for your attention and, um, you know, for, you know, having me here and, uh, you know, thanks to Ron for discussing. Looking forward to your comments. Great. Thank you so much, um, Daniel. And now Daron is going to be discussing the paper and you're going to have um, 20 minutes. Thank you, Leah, and uh, thank you to all the organizers for inviting me to discuss this very interesting paper. I'm really uh, delighted to be here to share my thoughts on this. And uh, 
you know, I don't think I need to give much of an introduction, but there are tremendous advances in generative AI, especially large language models, and a complete set of disconnecting thoughts about whether these are going to be, you know, job apocalypse, like Daniel referred to, or like the more sort of tech optimistic outlets such as the Econo Economist magazine or the McKinsey double statement saying nothing to worry about. It's always been like this and we're going to get lots of jobs and huge productivity improvements. And how can we know this? So first step is to measure what's going to happen, who's going to be impacted. And uh, the paper by Daniel Rock and co-authors uh, is an excellent first step. And I think the authors need to be congratulated on doing such a careful job and as a service to both the profession and journalists, because I think pretty much any empirical study of these technologies on the labor market has to start from some measure of where do we expect the results to be, the impacts to be greater. It's very careful and it's very well explained. So you can sort of trace the steps that the authors have taken. And of course, one if one was sort of so inclined, one could quibble with some of the details. And you can say that I'm gonna do one set of quibbles in a second, but I don't see them as quibbles. But I'll, I'll say one thing that I really like is their effort to validate it from multiple points of view. Daniel here is building on his earlier work with Eric Brynjolfsson and Tom Mitchell, where they developed the suitability for machine learning SML index, doing validation with human subjects as well as computer science, deep knowledge of what machine learning could do. So this is sort of extending that one step and especially the last validation was very crucial for me, the uh, using GitHub information about what people are using it. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to criticize is the wrong word. I don't want to use, I don't want to criticize it. I like the paper a lot, but I'm going to somewhat complain about the conceptual framework that Daniel is using. And I think that conceptual framework impacts how they approach the problem. And I think I will invite the authors to think about the next steps from the viewpoint of a, in my opinion anyway, but I'm not objective, but in my opinion, a better conceptual framework that I think can be much more fruitful. But to set, lay the scene, let me go back to Daniel and others earlier work. Uh, the pre-generative AI uh, analysis of this was, uh, I think the first paper was actually by Daniel, Eric, and Tom on suitability of machine index, more or less around the same time. Uh, Ed Felton, uh, Raj, and Rob Siemens' work, Exposure to AI Index, and Michael Webb's Exposure to AI Index from Patent Data came out. And they are using somewhat different strategies. But what's common between these three approaches and what the current paper is doing is that it's an exposure measure without digging into the details of what exposure really means. And in particular, if you read those three papers, all three of them are excellent and uh, worth reading, they describe their expectations somewhat differently. I think my, da Daniel can correct me, but uh, BMR, SML measure is more sort of automation, machine learning, doing some tasks. Whereas Felton, Raj, and Siemens often talk about complementarities as well as uh, as well as automation. And, and Webb is, I think, also a little bit like Daniel and co-authors more on the automation side. But this fact that there is this gray area and that they're, of course, doing different things is already highlighting that exposure is like a somewhat of a broad measure. There might be some different animals in there, and those may have very different implications. So to sort of show you what those measures capture in the data, let me show a couple of figures from a paper that I wrote with David Otter, Joe Hazel, and Pascual Restrepo published in the Journal of Labor Economics. So there we proxy for AI activity at the establishment level using what it used to be burning glasses data on 
vacancy postings. And uh, here is for uh, the sort of the broad picture for pre-generative AI, you see quite a bit of AI related activity as proxied by people hiring AI technology specialists to implement these technologies at the establishment level. And it's fairly broad across the economies, very small. Narrow AI vacancies are still less than 1% of all vacancies in the United States by 2020. Uh, but, but, but there's a big takeoff somewhere around 2016. And you see it actually even in manufacturing. You know, this is information, professional and business services and finance was not so surprising. But the fact that even in manufacturing, you see this is actually quite interesting. But what are the establishments that are at the forefront of this? So here is their measures. And to make this not tables, which it's not as much fun to look at in the context of discussion, but figures uh, I'm showing you by quartiles. So first quartile are the establishments that have the lowest, so let, let me focus on SML, lowest uh, score by Eric, Tom, and Daniel's measure. Second quartile is the next 25%, fourth and third quartile. So what you see is, first of all, the, the, the measures are not exactly the same. So there you see the differences uh, just by looking at these four pictures. But broadly speaking, all three of these measures are capturing where AI-related activity is. So the more exposed an establishment is by Daniel, Eric, and Tom's measure, or by Ed, uh, Siemens, and Raj's measure, uh, the more AI activity they are exhibiting. Now, what does this do to these firms, other dimensions of hiring? So for example, if the Felton et al measure is really a human complementarity measure, now it's gonna depend on some economic forces, which I'm gonna get into in a second, in a little bit more detail, but you might expect that actually these fourth quartile firms that are more exposed or establishments that are more exposed to AI might also hire more workers because now they're trying to make their workers more productive. But actually what we found is the opposite in a regression sense. And you can already see the green and the blue, which are the more exposed establishments are actually slowing down their hiring relative to the less exposed establishment. And that's true again with all three of the measures. So this looks like AI being used for automation rather than more of the human complementarity. But there might be some aspects of human complementarity and I'm gonna to come to that in the context of uh, what's the right conceptual framework here. It's sort of a little bit ironic that when we do the statistical analysis, this was particularly strong with the Felton et al's measure, which is the one that was perhaps aiming to be most complementary. Again, it shows that the exposure thing as a whole is a bit of a mixed bag. So all of this should not be a surprise because I think, and this is gonna be my call to the authors, we need to unpack what AI exposure means. And they already talk about this a little bit in the paper. They to take one step to, by doing the intersection of their automation rubric and the GPT-4 rubric. Uh, but, but let me give you the theory for this. And the theory, you know, uh, at least the way I understand it goes back to my work with Pasquale Restrepo and what we sort of highlight there is that new technologies can do three things, many things, but three of them are particularly modal. They can automate tasks and displace workers. They can change the productivity of factors in the tasks that they are performing already. And they create new tasks and in doing so reinstate workers back into the production process. So here is a diagrammatic exposition. I think if I had equations, it would be even easier, but I know again, equations are not cool in discussions and our audience is uh, uh, from diverse backgrounds. So I'm gonna try to do this verbally rather than with equations. So I think of this as the set of tasks that need to be performed. These ones below some threshold I are allocated to capital. These ones above uh, I and between some upper threshold N are allocated to labor. Now, what does increase productivity of factor mean. It means that you take, for example, some of these tasks, perhaps all of them, perhaps a subset, and you make labor more productive. 
or you could create new tasks. So this here extends and I remains at I. So now there are more tasks that labor can perform. The way this, the way I have done it is that I've shifted the, un, the, the set of tasks here so that it still, still remains unit one, but that's not so important. Or they can automate tasks. Now, a lot of the models that economists use and a lot of the language that both journalists and economists use is insufficiently clear about what we mean in terms of this framework. And this actually matters a lot. For example, and this is my quibble or complaint about the conceptual framework that the paper is bringing, is that their E1, E2 is very unclear whether we're talking about increasing the productivity of tasks of labor, creating new tasks or automating tasks. So automation, again, they come back to it at the end, but these three things are very different. So let me try to explain in what way they are different. So, and to do that, let me focus for the simplest things. Let me focus on the labor share of value added, which means that take a set of firms or an industry or an occupation could be fine also. And it has a particular value added contribution to output. How much of that value added goes to labor? How much of it goes to capital, including profits and user cost of capital? So the theory is the following. If what we're doing is automating tasks, it always reduces the labor share. If what we're doing is create new tasks, it always increases labor share. And if we're changing the productivity of factors, its effects on the labor share depends on the elasticity of substitution. And at least my reading of the paper was that some of these issues were not sufficiently clear. So for example, uh, Daniel and co-authors talk about the large language models or GPT-4 improving productivity in certain tasks or occupations a la on it. But does that mean that labor is becoming more productive? Is that really complementing labor or is it automating? So for example, one thing that I might be getting out of large language models is that half of the tasks that I was performing is now performed by uh, GPT-4 or chat GPT. I devote my time to the remaining half. If that's the case, that will always be bad for my share of output. But alternatively, perhaps what it does is that it makes me more productive in all of the tasks that or some subset of tasks that I'm performing. Now you can immediately see if you reason about this, that this is gonna have a very different effect than pure automation, but it won't necessarily help me. So for example, work by Eric, uh, Daniel Lee and uh, 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 Lindsay Raymond and our students at MIT, Shaket. Noi and Whitney Zhang show that in some small scale experiments or in some customer service tasks and writing tasks, certain types of workers can save time and even improve their quality of writing. So that sounds like increasing productivity. If you are the only worker using ChatGPT, that's going to be good for you. But if the whole industry uses ChatGPT, then those tasks are gonna become very abundant. So now the elasticity of substitution are gonna matter. And Daniel hinted at this and said, oh, capital labor elasticities. But it's only for this type of effect. For example, if it's automation or new tasks, elasticity of substitution don't matter or they don't matter in the same way. So it's really important both for the equilibrium effects that Daniel rightly emphasized and also for just understanding the impact implications that we actually distinguish between these three types of effects. And I think the current exposure measure doesn't exactly do that. Now, one thing you can say, well, it's impossible to do. There is an element of that, that new tasks are gonna be hard. So for example, you know, Daniel's measure has zero for electricians. Well, I would claim that generative AI can be very useful for electricians because you can use generative AI for real time diagnosis of problems that otherwise would require several visits from more and more experienced electricians. But that's very difficult to do because that task doesn't exist right now and that application on top of the foundation model hasn't been built. But at least historically we can do so. So, and let me mention two sort of uh, approaches. One is a very reduced form structural approach that Pasquale and I have uh, developed, 
which is to look at at the macroeconomic level of reinstatement and displacement. And when we did that, what we found was that actually there was a lot of automation coming from digital technologies and other technologies from 1945 to the mid 1980s, both in the entire economy and manufacturing, but then the reinstatement and the new tasks really slowed down and automation accelerated. So that sort of raises issues, which direction Large, large language models are going to go. But the, this is not that great because it's quite, you know, you have to make functional form assumptions and you can't identify which are the occupations and so on. A uh, much better sort of approach here is the one recently developed by David Otter, Caroline Chin, Anna Salomons, and Brian Sigmiller, and where they do both patent analysis a la web. And they look at the handwritten census responses uh, to occupation questions to identify new tasks, which is something that uh, you know goes back to Jeff Lynn's work. And and when they do this, they distinguish. They also do a great thing, which is they distinguish between automation and augmentation. Now, even this is not ideal because what is augmentation? Well, is increasing labor's productivity augmentation or is new tasks augmentation? Again, as I've argued, those two are very different. So they're bundling them the same. So it's one step ahead. It's separating the top two from the bottom one, but the top two are actually quite different themselves. So here is their data, for example, on automation and, uh, and augmentation. On the left is the 1940 to 1980 period. On the right is 1980 to 2018. And you can see, you know, the automated tasks are elevator operators, telegraph operators in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, electricians, and actually operatives and uh, kindred workers, job setters, foremen. These are actually getting a lot of augmentation according to their data. But go here, and many of the manual tasks are now more in the automation. And here you have a lot more of the knowledge tasks. So now, GPTs are coming for knowledge tasks, but is it going to be for augmentation or automation? So let me skip this where they show that actually their, their, their procedure for augmentation is a bit black box. I don't perf myself. Their automation procedure builds on web and I think it's quite clear. Their augmentation, both conceptually, it's a little bit unclear because is it new tasks? Is it worker productivity increasing? And it's very indirectly read from the patent data, but it sort of fits the data. So uh, when they have more automation, again, red is for, uh, <clears throat> this, this label has cut out, uh, red is for the more recent period, blue is the, for, the, uh, for the earlier period, you see more augmentation patterns associated with more new task creation, new titles in the occupations and the handwritten records. But most impressive, is that when they then do a regression analysis at the occupation industry level, cell, cell level, they find exactly the theoretical prediction. Again, taking augmentation to be at least in heavy measure, the new tasks creation. Augmentation patterns are associated with expanded industry cell, industry occupation cell employment. Automation patterns are associated with decline. And that pattern in fact becomes even stronger in the 19, post-1980 period. So putting their results, which are, I think, much more compelling than our sort of structural exercise, the structural exercise that Pascual Restrepo and I have done, sort of the two are complementary, and they also suggest that perhaps we are getting a lot more automation and a lot less of this augmentation from digital technologies pre-generative AI. So where are we going to go? So my call to the authors, therefore, is twofold. One is I think this is a great infrastructure. But I think conceptually, I think they would be better served if they gave up the nomenclature of the neoclassical black box production function in terms of increased productivity, worker factor productivity increases, be much more explicit about which tasks workers become more productive in, or and are you adding new tasks and automation of tasks. So in some sense, add to their rubric of E1, E2, E3, more of E1 of automation sort, E1 of factor productivity increase, and E1 of new task. And then this is going to be just the right language 
and they can build on the steps that they already took in terms of intersecting this with the automation information and, and start developing something that goes beyond the exposure measure so that we can do the types of analysis that Outer et al. have already started with the historical data. We can see whether exposure of the automation form has different productivity effects, different labor effects, and so on. I think the stakes are really big because this is what we need. And I think this will also help the journalists. Daniel was right in complaining that journalists misunderstand this because they don't understand what exposure means. And I think that's partly journalists' fault, but it's also because exposure, where we've been somewhat hiding behind the exposure measure, because when we don't know what that exposure is doing, okay, we say it's all exposure, but it sort of uh, leaves it open for either journalists or interested parties to interpret it in the way that they want rather than in the way that they should. But overall, this is fantastic work. Thank you to Daniel and the co-authors and thanks to Leah and other organizers for inviting me to share my thoughts on it. Thank you so much, uh, Daran, for this very, very insightful and, and um, very useful discussion. So we now have time for questions from uh, the audience. We have a few minutes for, for questions. Please do submit your uh, questions in the Q&A uh, while we wait for questions to come in. Maybe, Daniel, if you want to respond uh, quickly to Daran, take a few seconds to respond, um, and then we'll move on with the, the Q&A part. Thank you, Daran. Yeah, thanks, Jerome. That's a that was a wonderful discussion and uh, very thought provoking. I learned a lot, um, you know, listening to what you had to say there. And I also will be hitting you up for those slides. Um, so, yeah, I think um, with respect to understanding differences between, you know, what's automation, what's uh, you know productivity enhancing within the set of tasks we already have, I think we can definitely push on that and. Um, you know, continue to expand this framework so that we don't hide behind the exposure idea and it can be a lot more clear. I agree entirely on all those points. Um, I have to think a little bit harder about how we can pros prospectively figure out where task reinstatement is going to happen. Um, you know, I think historically there are ways to do that. Uh, and maybe that's the best we can do is just say, wait and see. And then, you know, let's, let's look at, at how new tasks were created. Um, but it does make me think that maybe there's a, a, an analogy for, you know, the Balmol's cost disease stuff, you know, is it the jobs that have the lowest sets of employment that have the highest rate of new task creation? Is it the jobs that, you know, are more widespread, easier to access and so on, where we see more labor reinstatement? Um, and what are the interesting economics around why that might be uh, one way or the other? So um, lots of interesting economics to, to do. And um, I'm going to talk to my co-authors and and figure out how to best pursue this because I think it's a wonderful, great direction. Um, cool. So I guess now we can do a general Q and A. All right. Thank you. So we have a question um, from Daniel who says, "Do specialized uh, LLMs like Bloomberg GPT and Hypocratic um, AI fall into the E2 category, or should we think be thinking about them differently to GPT models?" Daniel. Right. So I'll I'll make a there's a, let's see, what's the best way to put this? I think Bloomberg GPT, for example, is um, a tool used to get to E1. Um, it's, you know, to the extent that it could be E2, it's you needed to compile a bespoke data system around financial data like Bloomberg had done, and then combine that with the LLM. But, um, you know, that complementary investment has already been done. So prospectively, I'm going to say, if you have to put it into a category, it's going to be E1, but it's more we should be looking at what people would be doing with Bloomberg GPT um, and, and how that would, you know, qualify as E1, E0, E2, and so on. Um, okay, so I hope that answers the question. Yes, we have another question, maybe more technical. So the GPT-4 seems to be relying on self-regulation and learning through consensus. Is there any structured governance model that could validate the self-regulation and consensus processes. Hmm. Uh, Tom, if you're there, I uh, would love to just clarify, what, what do you mean by self-regulation and, and governance? I'm, I wanna make sure I answer the question uh, you know, in the proper terms. I don't know if Tom, maybe we can we can um, we can discuss this in the in the oh Tom is here and he can join. So that's great. Okay. Um, Tom, you can unmute yourself if you want to. If you want to clarify your question, otherwise we can just move on to. We can talk about this in the unrecorded um, portion. Hold on. 
Oh, no. oh. Uh, by, by self-regulation, I just mean that uh, you, uh, the model is, uh, uh, the chat GPT-4 is something where you uh, have a, a population which is in, interacting with the software and hardware. And whatever the feedback processes are, they're regulated by those interactions. And then the consensus learning, I guess, would have more to do with how uh, when uh, uh, ChatGPT4 gives feedback, what this uh, selection processes are and how the, uh, the, uh, the human interaction makes a choice between the, the various uh, feedback given by the system. Gotcha, gotcha. Does that make sense to you? I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, so my understanding of how these models are trained, once you've gotten past the initial steps, which are like predict the next word from a sequence of words, right? Um, at that point, you can start to generate text. And then what you would do is you either take humans or you know what's been referred to as reinforcement learning with AI feedback or constitutional AI, and you rank all the different kinds of or outputs that they can generate. So now the thing you're going to train on is trying to learn those ranks and generate a reward function. So that at each step, it's saying, how can I generate the next word or the, the rest of the prompt uh, to maximize the value um, of the reward, which is trained on how happy I'm making the end user. So to the extent that there's you know, possibly biases in this system where you know people, how they rank the the prompts might be bespoke to a particular group. Like there's a lot of different things that still need to be interrogated to figure out um, you know, how effective those systems are. But I will say I'm not an expert necessarily in training these large language models and, and getting that stuff to work properly. So um, you know, I'm mostly a consumer of that research trying to understand better like, you know, what's going on there, but also what are the economic implications? So you know, maybe I'm a little narrow in that track, but it's it's a fun track. Um, Thank you. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Thank you so much to our speakers, to Daniel and, and Jaron. A uh, big round of you know, virtual applause. Um, we are now going to enter the unrecorded uh, discussion part. Um, and so please stay on this um, on, in this Zoom room um, where we upgrade you to a panelist so that we can we can interact and continue the, the discussion for a little bit. I know I have a few questions I'd like to, to ask myself and those of you who have um, you know, type in your, your questions, you, you can stay and, and ask it uh, directly. Um, just quickly, I would like to announce that our next webinar is going to be uh, in August, and so we will, and we will follow up with, with more details later. But thank you, everyone, um, and stay, stay in, the, in the room if you'd like to be upgraded to panelists.